Scott Thornbury is an ELT expert, an absolute authority in his field, and he's going to be talking to us today about performance. So over to you, Scott. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Federica. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you, Macmillan. Uh, and thanks, uh, everybody, for being here today. We're looking at, uh, I'm looking at the comment stream as, as you come in. I'm looking at all the different countries uh, represented here. And it's virtually the whole world uh, that's still awake. Um, I want a, a special shout out to my friends in uh, Ukraine. It was this weekend coming up that I was supposed to be coming to Kiev for the IATFL Ukraine <coughs> conference. And uh, of course, that's been cancelled. Uh, so I'm very sorry not to be there with you this weekend. And also for my friends in Belarus, if there's anybody here from Minsk, I was due to come to Minsk in May and that's been called off. And finally, anybody here from Brazil? I'm sure I saw Buena. I saw, I saw so, uh, <laughs> Argentina. That's close. Um, I would have been coming. Yeah, uh, there are some Brazilians here. And I'm sorry not to be there in July for Braz Tiso, which has also uh, been cancelled. So that's the way it is. We rely on the internet, as Federica says. Uh, and let's make the most of it. So uh, I want to uh, talk today, as Federica says, about performance. And I'm going to ask you first, again, just to test that we're all uh, interacting. I'm going to ask you a question. Just type into the comment uh, an answer to this question. What does performance mean to you? It can be a word. It can be two words. It can be a phrase. It can be a definition. Production, says somebody. Do something. Confidence, production, display, producing production, acting. Teach production theater output presentate drama fantastic okay you got the idea well we're all on the same page I'm going to look at performance from the point of view three uh, different aspects uh, the first one is uh, as usage uh, the second as um, production and the third as drama. Uh, and I hope it'll become clear as we go along that they are kind of connected. Okay, looking at um, performance as usage, I think those of you who have done a linguistics degree will know that performance uh, and competence are co contrasted by this man in the picture. Who is he? I'll give you a clue. Here's his book. <clears throat> yes, Noam Chomsky. And of course, he famously said, that uh, made a distinction between competence and performance. And in his attempt, in this book, in fact, uh, which came out in whenever, uh, he began this process whereby he attempted to kind of uh, represent language knowledge in terms of mathematical symbols, equating grammar, as it were, with mathematics. So here we get uh, pages and pages and pages of phrase structure, uh, grammar, where you can see that there's a very close resemblance, of course, to mathematics, and particularly here, as those symbols are uh, turned into uh, tree diagrams to represent sentences, which in this, in, at the same time represent what the speaker knows about the language. In one book on this topic, uh, they describe the phrase structure rules as linguists' models of a language user's knowledge. This is what linguists, looking at the language, hypothesize is what's in the language user's head. Uh, and not only that, but of course, Chomsky maintained that this knowledge is innate, that we're born with it, that it's hardwired into our brains uh, at birth. And he famously said in another book uh, that we must make a distinction between competence, that is what the, the speaker's knowledge of the language, and performance, the actual use of the language in concrete situations. And Chomsky and other generative linguists were only interested in competence, that is to say, the hardwired innate grammar system, which they hypothesized was responsible for performance, but performance, of course, is um, messy. 
performance because of all the constraints of speaking in real time comes out as not a good representation of what we are intuitively have stored or have had hardwired into our brain. So when you look at performance, and of course, people have only been looking at performance uh, recently, ever since the advent of uh, recording devices. But if you take a piece of spoken language, unscripted, uh, and look at it, you do see that it is incredibly messy. This comes from a book that came out in 1975, co-authored by David Crystal. I'm sure you know of David Crystal. And it was one of the first books of its kind which transcribed authentic extracts of spontaneous spoken English. And when you look at that, you can see, oh, what on earth is that? It is so messy. Where is the rhyme or reason? If I read it to you, maybe it sounds a little bit more like spoken English. So there's two men and they're talking about football, inevitably. And one says, well, what's the what's the, what's the failure with the football? I mean, this this I don't really see. I mean, it costs the money. How much does it cost to get in down the road now? Oh, well, I think it probably well, I think it probably is the money for what you get. You know, um, I was reading in the paper this morning. There's a chap. He's blah, 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 blah. So you can see when you hear it, it starts to come alive. When you look at it, it looks messy. But it. That's how language is produced. That is the performance. And this, after all, as for us as teachers, is what we're aiming, surely, to achieve with our learners. Not some abstract knowledge of the rules, but some ability to perform whether those rules are being activated or not. So another famous linguist who recently departed us, sadly, Michael Halliday, said, in contradistinction to Chomsky, says, instead of rejecting what is messy, we accept the mess and build it into the theory. We accept the mess. It's all about performance. Build your theory on what people say, not what you think they have innately in their heads. Not only, and so that has, for me, has enormous implications. But if you look at the mess closely, you see that it's not messy. Let's go back to our little extract. Well, what's the, what's the failure with the football? If you look at that carefully, you'll see that, in fact, it's composed entirely of extremely high frequency constructions. We we'll call them constructions because they're not really grammar and they're not really vocabulary. They're not even collocations necessarily. They are. Let's have a look at some of them. What's the X with? What's the failure with the football? He says, what's the X with? What other words? would you put into X there? It could substitute for X. What's the deal with? Thank you, Dylan. What's the matter with? What's the problem with? Exactly. What's the trouble with? And that's, in fact, if you look at a corpus of spoken language, you'll find that the four most common words that go into that slot are deal, matter, problem, and story. What's the story with? Now, in the, on our conversation about the football, he uses failure. What's the failure with? So it's a bit like problem. It's not as common as problem, but it's legitimate. It fits into that slot in this fixed construction. Let's have another look at another construction. I mean, I mean, I mean. He says, I mean, about two or three times. I mean, I mean is so common. In fact, um, it's the... I think there's a thousand or more examples of occurrences of I mean in every million words of spoken language, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's an enormous lot, actually, compared to a lot of high frequency vocabulary. What about this one? I don't really see. I don't really see. See, what other verbs could go into the C slot there? I don't really understand, know, get it, mean, get Get, no, mean, <laughs> yes, good. Okay, the most common one is no, according to the corpus. The most frequent one in that slot is no, then have, care, I don't really care, want, like, and see is number six, followed by think. But these are all incredibly frequent expressions. They are fixed formulaic expressions. Because he says, cause the, cause the money, cause the money, and then he doesn't finish, that's it. Cause the money, it's an expression. It doesn't have any verb. It's just thrown in. It's a, it's a topic marker. Of course, the internet, of course, the weather, of course, the coronavirus, uh, and very, very frequent. Here's another one. Um, 
<clears throat> how much does it cost to? Oh, yeah, incredibly common. How much does it cost to go to buy to see to blah, blah blah? And finally, down the road, what do you think is the most common noun in the construction? Down the. Down the way, down the street, down the line, down the street, down the drain, <laughs> down the pub. Uh, actually, it's down the road. And this is the data from the 14 billion word iWeb corpus, um, sister corpus of the corpus of a contemporary American English. Down the road, 107,000 examples, incredibly common, both in its literal and its metaphorical sense. So what I'm saying is, that conversation is not messy. It's constructed of prefabricated formulaic utterances with variable slots, slots for different verbs, different nouns, etc. It's not grammar, but it's not vocabulary. It's this big, hazy, fuzzy, gray area, huge area that we call constructions, phraseology, or whatever. But it's not captured by Chomsky's phrase structure rules and it's led people to believe in co in contrast to chomsky that in fact we can think of the knowledge that we carry which enables our performance as being like a mental corpus not a lot of rules and mathematical symbols but a corpus a collection of data and it's acquired by a bottom-up process not a top-down process of rule you know, innate rules generating sentences, but it's a bottom up process of acquisition through exposure to usage events, to massive exposure to massive amount of data spoken and written over our lives. We're talking about first language here, but the implications for second language, I think, are strong. And so this writer goes on to say, knowing a language consists not in knowing a battery of rules but in accumulated memories of previously encountered utterances and the generalizations which arise from them. In other words, what we're carrying is an expanding database which has the ability to recognize patterns to abstract the grammar from the data. That is to say, uh, it is usage based it's usage based and that's my meaning of performance in this case it's not about competence it's about performance it's about usage and as some these scholars go on to say if language is learned for worldly use the learning process itself the learning process must be use based based on usage in other words it's not that competence drives performance it's the other way around performance creates competence it's through usage and performance that we become competent users of the second language or our first language, whatever. So that's number one. Let's move on. That was performance as a usage. Let's look at performance as production. What's this stand for? Anybody want to guess? PPP? <sighs> Present presentation. Oh, here we go. Oh, I love it. Look at that. Presentation practice. Performance, production, production, presentation. Yes, 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 yes. Celta stuff. Absolutely. The famous formula for designing a lesson. Presentation, present the grammar. Today is Tuesday. We're going to do the present perfect continuous. Uh, then we're going to practice it, blah, 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 through some uh, some control practice activities. And finally, we get to the production stage where we're going to use it with considerable fluency and confidence. And, of course, this model of uh methodology has been around for a very long time nobody actually can remember who first invented it it's attributed to this man don Byrne, who wrote a book called teaching oral english in 1976 so it's uh, it's been around for a while and don Byrne said in this book in fact talking about the production stage remember the third stage he says it's a pity that language learning in the classroom so often stops short at this stage, yeah? They do the presentation, they do the practice, and then that's it. Okay, everybody, close your book, see you next week. But what happened to the production stage? Many teachers feel that they have done their job well if they have presented the new material effectively and given their students adequate, though perhaps controlled practice in it. 
and then he goes on to say in 1976 all the same no real learning can be assumed to have taken place until the students are able to use the language for themselves production performance usage okay that's kind of obvious but it's very easy to forget the production stage we've all done it we all get so involved in teaching all the intricacies of the present perfect continuous or the second conditional and then practicing it and then oh what end of lesson okay that was fine tomorrow we're going to do the second conditional the present perfect continuous or the third conditional and that's it production out the window one way of making sure that the students get the production stage is to reverse the order of stages. And this is exactly what was suggested by some of the early architects of the communicative approach. 1976, Don Byrne said that. 1976, does that ring a bell? Some of you weren't even born in 1976. Um, in 1979, one of the architects of the um, communicative approach, Chris Brumford, contrasted the PPP cycle. You can see that's at the top there. He calls it present, drill, practice. And then round we go, present the present continuous, practice, drill it, practice it, round we go. Now we're going to do the present simple, round we go. That's the traditional model, yeah? An alternative model, which starts with production basically starts with communicate as far as possible with all the available resources yeah so instead of today we're going to do the past simple no tell me what you did last weekend and the students go mm. well they recognize the word weekend last weekend last weekend i um i go with my family we go country and the teacher then the next stage, present language items shown to be necessary for effective combination. Ah, ah, ah. So you went to the country with your family, did you? Hmm. What was the weather like? Weather is very hot. Weather, listen, was very hot. Yeah, writes it on the board, blah, blah, blah. So that's the cycle that starts with production. Doesn't finish with production, which gets left off. Starts with production. Test, teach, test, exactly. Drill if necessary. Then around we go to another task. Yeah, another communicative task. So this is the basis, if you like, of the communicative approach, the strong, what's called the strong form of the communicative approach. Or more popularly known as the um, task-based approach. And the task-based approach is all about starting with communication or starting with fluency. Dave Willis who was another great scholar of the same generation, said, contrasted the two, he said, a presentation methodology, that's PPP, is based on the belief that out of accuracy comes fluency. That is to say, accuracy is a prerequisite for fluency. But it's not in your first language, after all. I mean, we don't get accurate in our mother tongue until we're five or six or maybe 16. We start off expressing meanings. But for some reason, people think, oh, no, no, second language is different. We'll start off with accuracy, get it right, get it right, get it right, and then the students hopefully will become fluent. Well, I mean, I'm sorry, but a lot of us experienced teachers know that that doesn't necessarily follow. So Willis went on to say, by contrast, a task-based methodology is based on the belief that out of fluency comes accuracy. That is to say, accuracy is the fine tuning. Express your meanings and then I'll tidy them up for you. We'll make them better one way or the other. And it's based on the belief that learning is prompted and refined by the need to communicate. After all, language learning is all about the need to communicate. People learn languages not just because it's interesting and fun. I mean, okay, some people do, but because they want to communicate, presumably, in this language by writing or speaking or both or whatever. So why not make communication central to the process? And so we get, uh, we get this model then, as I said before, it starts with communication. Uh, and, but how does the student get better if the student starts? What's the isn't there a danger if the students start making mistakes from day one, they'll never get better. And not only that, they'll infect each other. The mistakes will get ooh, like contagious, like coronavirus. 
No, because if they're given feedback on their production, then this is how the whole thing is moved along. And Martin Bygate, my ex-professor from University of Reading, said quite recently uh, in a book about task repetition, he says a key component of successful learning in context using tasks, that is to say in task-based learning, has been found to be the presence of feedback associated with repeated practice. Feedback, repeated practice. Repeated practice. That doesn't mean to say repetition drills. It's not repeating, repeating, repeating a sentence. No, it's repeating the task and getting feedback each time. So the teaching cycle looks like something like this. You do the task, you get feedback, then you repeat the task and you get more feedback and you go round and round and round. And each time you go round, you're getting more accurate and your language is becoming more complex, more sophisticated, greater range of grammar and vocabulary. That's a theory, and the research is bearing this out. Martin Bygate, in this book, uh, there's a lot of articles with research papers studying the, exactly this, the effect of task repetition. And Bygate says there is a strong effect for task rep repetition. That is to say the research shows it's a positive effect for doing tasks more than once. The evidence strongly supports the view that previous experience of a specific task aids speakers, yeah, previous experience of a specific task aids speakers to shift their attention from processing the message content. What am I trying to say? Last weekend, I go to country with um, to working on formulations of the message. And so each time they repeat the task, they're getting a little bit better because they can devote some of the attention away from the meaning and onto the form. And that's what I'm doing now. I did this webinar this morning. It was a little bit, uh, 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 lucky you weren't there. We had some technical hitches, etc. didn't help, but it was the first time I'd done it. Now I'm doing it a second time. It's a little bit more fluent, believe me. You can watch the recording if you don't. So how do you get task repetition without boring the students? You can't say to the students, do that again, do that again, do that again. Well, you, <laughs> how lucky we are, we are indeed. Uh, you change the seating. That's one way you can have students repeating a task, but they change their partner. And this is from Jim Scrivener's lovely book published by, hello, Macmillan, uh, Learning Teaching. And you have different combinations of what he calls buzz groups. Yeah, so you have little group, little group, little group, and then people change. One person moves from one group, one person. Another. And so there's a new, there's new input into the buzz group. And the person who arrives has to have be told what's going on. So there's a lot of repetition. Or on the right, the famous wheels or what I call the onion. So it's like two layers of an onion. Uh, so you have the outer circle and the inner circle. And the outer circle may be holding up a picture of the family tree. Or uh, if they're kids, there may be a photo of their pet. The inner circle, face them and say, oh, that's your pet. What is it? It looks like a mongoose. No, 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 it's a, a chihuahua. What's its name? How old is it? How big is it, etc. Yeah. So they have, and then they move. Teacher says, okay, everybody move one. The ones in the middle circle move around one, or if you like, the ones in the outer, it doesn't matter, but change partners. And they do the same thing again and again and again. <laughs> Speed dating, exactly. It's a great way of practicing language. It's a great way of finding a partner. So this is what I mean by task repetition. Now, challenge. This is the challenge. That's all very well in the classroom, in the classroom, but classrooms momentarily don't exist anymore because we're all teaching online. How would you do this online? How could you create this kind of task repetition element online if all your students are scattered around in different parts of the town and and for breakout rooms fantastic zoom breakout rooms if you know how to do it i don't but if you know how to do that then you put your buzz group is in one breakout room and another one in another and then you can ask them to move so that's a great idea you can get them to repeat tasks anyway measure our students told the story about going to the country for the weekend the teacher can say okay that was good that was good but i want you to go home well, you are home. Okay, stay home, but go offline. And before the next lesson, 
record yourself on your phone doing exactly that task, upload it onto the class wall, and I'll give you, I'll show you some software in a minute that you could do that with. And the very fact that they know that it's going to be uploaded and other students are going to listen to it is going to force their attention on the form. They're going to say, oh, oh, I better pay attention to the past tense verbs, yeah? I better practice a few times. Fantastic, fantastic exercise. Even if you, I mean, anyway, let's move on quickly because we're running out of time. I said that feedback is important, but where does the feedback come from? We know it comes from the teacher normally, but when? Uh, this is a wonderful book that was written by this linguist called James Paul G. when he was watching his son, his 14-year-old son, playing video games. And he noticed that these video games are very well designed. Uh, so that they got maximum, you got maximum uh, input when you needed it at the point of need, at that point of need. Write it down, great expression. So when you're playing a video game, typically you don't read a long list of instructions beforehand. You just start. You start, and then when you get stuck, you go to the help index, yeah? Or you go onto a web page, a dedicated web page, where lots of other geeks will tell you answers to your questions. Well, I don't understand. I got it. What do I do here, et cetera? So he formulated this idea that language learning and education generally should be about this kind of at the point of need feedback. You get feedback not after the event, not for before the event, obviously, but during the event. And I like this idea. And one of the things he said about video games, they operate by a principle, listen to this, of performance before competence you try you try the thing out before you look, become competent players can before perform before they are competent because they are supported by the design of the game the smart tools the game offers and often to other more advanced players in the game or in chat rooms this is this is exactly applicable to language learning if the if the material and the lesson are well designed and if this, there are smart tools in the form of a teacher providing help when necessary, and there are other players that you can call on, whether they're in the room or in chat rooms, then this is how you construct the kind of knowledge which, which through performance makes you more and more competent. So I see lots of interesting parallels here and lots of implications for online learning. Uh, for writing, for example, where students do writing, send the writing text to the teacher. The teacher then goes through it uh, using software like screencasting software, like Jing, Jing, J-I-N-G, for example, free. You then you you talk through the students' writing. They you it, it's recorded. You send them the recording, and they can follow your train of thought as you go through their writing. Um, that's that kind of intervention can be really, really useful. Russell Stannard will be talking about that, I'm sure, in the next webinar uh, this week. Okay, let's move on. Okay, we've talked about. Uh, okay, so that to sum up, then uh, what uh, all these people are saying is that performance precedes competence. Yeah, the task-based people, James Paul G, etc. So let's move on to the third of my definitions of performance, the ones that's the, perhaps the most obvious, performance as drama. Now, um, people for a long time have realized that there's an intimate association between language and uh, acting, if you like, uh, and performance and, and gesture and... Uh, in fact, way back in 1930, whenever it was, the anthropologist, 35, Ma Malinowski said, looking at how uh, people in the Pacific Islands were using language to do their tasks, their daily routine, said, ultimately, all the meaning of all words is derived from bodily experience. And I'm not going to go into that now. I just throw it out because I've got another whole talk about embodiment and gesture. But I just want to introduce you to, uh, I wish he was a friend of mine. I don't know him, but I love his book. Uh, this is a French writer 
called uh, Jean, or linguist Jean Remy Lapère. This is his book. Uh, it's in French. Uh, and what it's, it's amazing because what it is, it's a grammar of English represented through bodily motion, through performance. So I'll give you an example of what I mean. Um, here is one of the actors. So There's a CD that comes with the book. And there's lots of YouTube. I'll give you the YouTube link. And by the way, there will be a PDF for those of you who came in late, a PDF uh, of those slides so you can get the links. So this is the actor demonstrating the concept of, through movement, through gesture, of the present perfect. So what's he doing? He's, you can't see it because it's a still, and I can't show you the video on this, but you can go to the YouTube. He's reaching this, he's reaching behind him into his experience because he's been asked the question, have you ever been to New York? He's reaching into his experience and then he's finding, oh, oh, and he brings it out. New York. Yes, I have it. I have the experience. I have been to New York. Or somebody says, have you been to Shanghai? He reaches into his experience and he comes up with an empty hand. No, I haven't been. Isn't that wonderful? And this is the book is full of these. Uh, <laughs> Hi from Shanghai. He's full of these examples. There he is holding the experience yeah i have it i have it that's why we say i have it's the present perfect it's not the past it's the present i have the experience here look look isn't that wonderful so this idea of relating grammar and ex to to gesture and embodiment is implicit in this book and this these videos and i uh i, I urge you to have a look at that it helps if you can speak French, but <clears throat> you'll get the gist of it. So what he said was, Monsieur Lapère said, language is not only about expressing meaning. It's not only about being expressive. It's about shaping meaning and performing meaning. And this brings us into the area of drama, performing meaning. Uh, and uh drama of course we've all been doing drama activities in our classes from the year dot we do role plays we do acting we do sketches we do etc it's only un recently strangely enough that there's been a lot of well, any research as to the effects of drama uh on language learning which surprises me but recently in a in a um edition of the tesol quarterly there was a very very good paper written research study done you on drama in the in the classroom what he did was they took two classes that were getting the same syllabus the same curriculum a learner-centered communicative very modern curriculum yeah so there's lots of speaking lots of listening but the experimental class was also doing drama activities on top of the curriculum and then they measured various things at the end and of course unsurprisingly perhaps the experimental group were better in many respects and this is the study there's there's the reference again don't forget the pdf you'll get it the results of our study suggest that use of drama techniques in language classrooms can have a significant impact on l2 oral fluency relative to other learner-centered communicative language practices. So, I mean, both groups were getting communicative teaching, but the group with the drama techniques was getting that extra bonus, which doesn't surprise us, I guess. But what's interesting, I think, is the second point that they, they discovered. Moreover, the drama techniques employed in our study appear to help learners develop strategies that are generalizable to a variety of novel speaking tasks. So what they're saying is the drama techniques not only helped oral fluency but in drama, but they also helped oral fluency in giving presentations, doing uh, debates, discussions, etc. So in other words, the oral fluency was generalizable to other kinds of tasks. And I think that's kind of encouraging too. So it's not just about 
So I want to talk about drama in the time that we've got left, and I want to introduce you to a project which I am um, I am intimately committed to, uh, and it is the Hands Up Project. Hands up if you've heard of the Hands Up Project. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Okay, you will. You will. No idea. Oh, good. Okay, so you're learning something. Okay, I'll tell you about the Hands Up Project. Um, it's a project that was established five years ago or so, and that's the, there's the website where there's the blog and there's a Facebook page. Uh, it was established by a colleague of mine called Nick Bilbra, who was doing a lot of work working with kids in difficult circumstances uh, particularly difficult circumstances in uh, Palestine and uh, particularly difficult circumstances in Palestine in the Gaza Strip where students uh, where, where everybody is locked in talk about lockdown uh, has no opportunity to use English with anybody outside of the Gaza Strip and so they and uh, so Nick had this idea well let's use the internet because at least they have the internet let's bring them activities and let's have them communicate outside the Gaza Strip using doing drama activities, doing plays and communicating with kids, and not just plays, but telling stories and doing communicative activities. So he set this project up. I am proud to say I'm a trustee of the project, and that's my particular interest. But I wanted to share you with some of the things that we do. So there's a playwriting competition, for example. So this is one of the plays. This is another one you can see that student kids write plays and they perform them. They upload them onto the internet. You can see these on YouTube uh, and, they and they perform them to other kids in other classrooms around the world, not just in their own region. And not only that, they do uh, lots of interactive activities. So here, for example, you see a screenshot with you've got on the left, you have a girl in Gaza. And she's doing a kind of show and tell, show and tell. Yeah. On the right, you have a classroom in Croatia in Split. Anybody here from Croatia? So you've got some students in Split and some students in Gaza. And they're doing, yeah, she's showing a piece of jewelry and telling the story and they're asking questions and they'll do the same thing. Uh, <laughs> great. We have some Croatians. Uh, and and that's it. And then here's another one. Um, this is uh, the imaginary world tour guide. So what the children do is they role play. So we're moving more into drama now, but they, it, or into imagination. They imagine a country, a country that you know, it, an imaginary, fictitious country, and then they give you. A guided tour of that country so they've got illustrations that they've made etc so they're using the internet to communicate their imaginative reconstruction of them. here's another one which is even more dramatic and this i love this this is a, a play a short play called lemon and mint and it's about two groups and they're performing this play simultaneously there's one group in gaza on the left and there's one group in a refugee camp in Jordan on the right. They've got performing the same play, but they're taking different roles in the play. It's about two sets of farmers. One group set of farmers grows lemons, and the other set of farmers grows mint. And they, they meet and they exchange their products to make a drink, which is famous in the region called lemon and mint. It's just lemon and mint, and it's delicious. Uh, but what's lovely about this is they perform the play at the same time using Zoom and two screens, and then cleverly they exchange or pretend to exchange their products, the lemons and the mint, across the screens. Uh, and then they make the drink. And isn't that lovely? I mean, it's just such a simple idea. But what I'm getting at now is that these ideas are transferable to the situation many of you are teaching in, which is online. And not having a class, but having students individually scattered around different locations. So the challenge is then, if we believe in this, and we believe that this performance, these drama activities are good for learners, and I believe 
I believe passionately that they are for all sorts of reasons, not just for their English, but for their motivation, uh, for their motivation, I mean, particularly. Then how can we construct using the situation many of us are in? So we've got all the students scattered around. They're not in one classroom, so they can't jointly perform. Uh, what could they do from their, ho their homes to other students using software like Zoom? And I think there's a lot of uh, possibilities. And the show and tell, for example, is one of them, whereby you have students not just show a piece of jewelry, but maybe perform something, perform a song that they like, perform, uh, pretend to be a character, to pretend to be somebody that they admire and the others have to guess who it is, et cetera. So individually, they can do that on Zoom, taking turns, yeah? That is a form of performance. You may have seen, there's a lot of these going around now. It's kind of viral uh, on YouTube. You'll see a lot of musicians are getting together on Zoom and they're performing music, yeah? So they'll perform together and from their separate locations, they'll perform a <clears throat> A, a concerto or whatever uh, and it's incredible how they managed to synchronize uh, these um, performances and they've got quite sophisticated software which will which will time it for them we don't need that just to get but you can imagine can't you kids or adults doing a similar thing with a drama piece taking roles and with a script or without a script depending how you want to do it improvised or with a script taking roles and although they're not in the same room they're doing the same piece of drama in real time and it can be recorded of course you can play it back you can do it again task repetition all sorts of possibilities there i think this is exciting and i have to say i mean we're in we're at we're in a new period now where all these kind of ideas need to be tested, but we have the technology for them. And essentially we have no choice but to do things like this. Um, here's some, and, and the other thing is, of course, they could also just do their own performance at home and upload these onto a class kind of wall. Um, so uh, one idea that I've just, I retrieved from the internet is that you have, you do a guided tour of your apartment. Okay, you're locked in, but here's my apartment. I'm just going to take you around my apartment. I'm going to film it, and then I'm going to upload that film onto the class wall. Or I'm going to have my mother film me while I go around. Or I'm going to film, uh, I'm going to <clears throat> film uh, what I can see from the window. Yeah, and I'm going to describe how it's different from what it usually is. All sorts of possibilities like that. Here's a piece of software which I've not used, but when I was researching this, it came up. I don't know if you're familiar with it, Flipgrid. And basically, students can then make their own videos, upload them. They're all on the same page, and they can look at them, um, and you can look at them and give them feedback, etc. So I just want to finish, before I throw it open, if you've got any more ideas, with a kind of summary of some performance possibilities online in the situation that many of you are at the moment where you're teaching remotely from your home to the homes of your students who are separated <clears throat> in terms of location. So as I said, this is a summary, really. One thing is a teacher can perform something. So I'm going to tell you the story about how I came to Spain, for example, or how I started teaching or how I met my partner or whatever. And the learners ask questions and respond. It's not really performance, but it's it's moving in that direction. Yeah. And it's it's acting as a model for the learners to do the same thing. But it could be imaginative. Okay. I'm going to pretend I'm a famous person and you ask me questions and I will answer as if I were that famous person. You have to guess who I am. Um, then individual learners perform to the rest of the class. It can be show and tell, a song, story, or poem. They can do this in real time, or it can be done at outside of class time and uploaded using the kind of software I showed you. 
And then moving on to the slightly more sophisticated thing, the learners, like the musicians, can take turns to perform a scripted or unscripted role play or sketch. Something they write, something's written for them, something maybe based on a folk tale that they were familiar with, a piece of drama or a soap opera or whatever. Soap opera is good because you're going to have different rooms. So you're going to have, you know, you're going to have one person in their room. You can imagine as being in an apartment building and they're all in their different rooms and they're all thinking aloud and they're all banging on the wall because other people are making noise or whatever. So there's possibilities there. Uh, and then finally, uh, much more sophisticated, the learners write, rehearse, perform, and record a short play, each one contributing their piece of the play, which is then put together on Zoom, if you like, and it's filmed, recorded, and played uh, back and shared with other classes around the world. So those are, I'm, uh, I'm, I have a couple more links here um that i found as i've been researching this um there is for example um a group of uh, two actors in spain who have started what they call the lockdown project project which is for exactly that it's for creating theater uh monologues uh based on characters while students are locked down at home the lock, and it, it's called Creation Drama Studio Spain. If you just Google that, Creation, and they have a YouTube video or two or three showing how to create a character, how to create a monologue, etc. Creation Drama Studio Spain, the lockdown project. Um, other stuff I've found that uh, I'd like to share include. Um, Let's see. I have a few couple of links here. I'll just drop them in. Um, my good friend Leo Sullivan in Israel uh, on his blog, he's been collecting ideas too. And I'll just some of these relate to uh, performance kind of things. I'll just. Uh, Drop that into the box if I can. The plug for Leo. Um, and yeah, Creation Drama Studio. And another couple of, I mean, other stuff uh, includes uh, there's a nice website where people who've been teaching online in China for the last two months because of the lockdown, have come up with all sorts of interesting ideas uh, for exploiting the medium, including drama. Uh, and this is another site, which I'm just going to upload, which is a teacher's blog, who's been doing a similar thing, I think, in Spain, uh, where she has come up with some great ideas also. So I'll just drop that in. Okay, folks, um, I just want to finish on a quote, and then I'll, we're almost there. Uh, this is from my good friend Dwight Atkinson in the University of Arizona in Tucson. says, and this is where we're at, I think. This is where we're at. And it says, to summarize these three perspectives I've been looking at, the idea of, of performance as usage, you use a language to learn it. You don't learn it to use it. The second one of performance is production, that if you'd save production to the end of the lesson, you're never going to get it done. So why not start with production? Um, and the third perspective on performance being as drama, as being performative. And this is, I think, all three perspectives are captured in this quotation by Dwight. One acquires a language in order to act. Yeah, we don't acquire a language in order to think about the language and learn its grammar. We acquire it in order to act, to do things, to do stuff. And we acquire it by acting, through experience, through performance, through usage. 
in a world where language is performative, where we perform our personalities, our, our identities. And he goes on. This is exactly why and how children learn their first language. There's no mystery to it. It's through acting and performance. And it accounts as well for most of the second stroke additional language learning going on in the world today. All that incidental language learning of people just getting on with it, you know, doing it, experiencing it, making mistakes, getting feedback, but doing it, performing, acting, living the language. So that is my, uh, that's how I like to finish. And that's my uh, Macmillan book. <laughs>